Okay, let's get started. Welcome back. I hope your reading weeks were relaxing and involved very little work. That's what they're supposed to be for, is to keep your mental sanity at an even keel through a long semester of university. If you work the entire time, at least you're prepared for the second half of the term, maybe? I don't know. Welcome back, anyway. Uh, the weather's turned. It's starting to get cold. The temperature in this room is really wonky all winter, just as an FYI. I taught in here all last year. Uh, it'll either be way too hot or freezing. There's really nowhere in between. So you may want to start bringing light jackets with you because you may have to leave them on during the lectures, just if you care about your personal temperature control. All right, so this is lecture seven. As I said at the end of last week, um, we are now halfway through the course. We are halfway through the material. Actually, we're a little more than halfway through the material. The way this course works out is that we actually have a little more time in the second half of the semester to, uh, to kind of build on the material a little bit more. We are now starting chapter three of the book. So we are going to finish chapter three for sure. We may do the first topic in chapter four. We're still not sure yet. It'll kind of, we'll play it by year in week 11 uh, based on where we're at. We are halfway down the quizzes. We are halfway down the workshops, all of that stuff. We will formalize the schedule for your lab exam end of term test in the next week or so. I need to meet up with the other professor and we need to look at the calendar and figure out which week we want to put it in. And we will announce that so that you know when you can start preparing for that. The final exam schedule has been released, at least to us. I don't know if they actually pushed it to you. They did, okay. Um, they hadn't, they didn't bother to tell us when they did it. They're like, check this, and then just radio silence. So I don't know when it goes live. So I'm glad you saw it. We actually have a pretty decent schedule, all things considered. We're not on a Sunday morning. We're at two o'clock in the afternoon. Like it could be far worse. And I'm sure you have another exam that is worse. The schedule here for the exams is very tightly packed. So every available slot gets used. We will have two rooms available to us for doing the exam. And we are going to distribute the people among those rooms. Probably everybody from our section, section A, is going to be in the bigger room, because we're a slightly bigger section, plus some people from the other section. And then the overflow from the other section will be in the second room. And there'll be one of the professors will be in each of the rooms, along with several TAs for proctoring and for helping and all that kind of stuff. So that's a while away yet, but you know, you're know you starting to think about it. Your midterms are almost over, and then it starts time to get ready for your exams. So the material now, a lot of the stuff we did in chapter two, we did with a, please trust me. It was a, this works. This is the formula, but we're not really going to explain where it comes from, or maybe we don't even give you the formula. We just give you a number and say, go with it. Chapter three goes back over a lot of that material, and we actually give the formulas. And we show you how things came about, at least to some extent, it is a first year class. And we kind of build the, the core structure of the course that the second semester is based on. So the first six weeks are really just trying to set the scene and bring you into the world and teach you the language and give you some experience playing with this stuff. This is where the mathy part actually starts. Now, it's not that bad. It's not calculus by any means. But it does, there are some formulas that start to show up and you are going to have to start doing a little bit more math. As you've seen, I think the last two weeks of assignments, you've seen it's been getting more mathematical, more numbers, and, and that will continue for the rest of the semester and into next, next semester as well. All right, so awesome. Sorry, my pen has decided it doesn't want to talk to my laptop.
All right, we're going to have to do it without. The pen does not want to write today, which is fun. Okay, uh, we are on chapter 3.1, inference for a single proportion, and we are revisiting the topics from the last two subchapters of chapter 2, but formalizing them and bringing them into a math world. So here's an example as a starter. Uh, this is a question that could be asked to you. Two scientists want to know if a certain drug is effective against high blood pressure. Classic clinical trial setup. We have a drug, we don't really know what it does. Let's scattershot and try and figure out what it does to the human body. That's modern um, pharmaceuticals for you. Um, that's what they do. They take a drug and they're like, well, it works for this. I wonder if it works for this other thing. I was having dinner with a with doctor friend of mine on the weekend and he was talking about this specialized blood condition that kids can get. Essentially, you get like sort of, it almost looks like a growth typically on the face. A series of blood vessels basically blow up. It's not dangerous. It just looks really weird and kind of, kind of bad. It almost looks like a really, really big birthmark, except it kind of grows out of the face. And then it usually just goes away. And it happens to some kids, and it just goes away. And it's a, I forget the, the technical name for it. They, it turns out they give them a drug for anxiety because that anxiety drug actually affects blood vessels, which in turn just makes these things just melt away like they were never there. And they found this completely by mistake, and they went, all right, and so they prescribed this drug, and they really don't know the mechanism whereby this drug causes this particular symptom to just disappear. That's modern pharmaceuticals for you. The human body is a black box, and we put stuff in and stuff happens, and then maybe sometimes it makes sense. If any member of your family has ever had depression or any sort of thing that has required medication from a, from a psychiatrist, that's most of modern psychiatry, is let's try this SRI. Oh, it doesn't work? All right, let's try this other one. Let's try this other one. And you just cycle it, getting more and more frustrated until they find one that works because we don't really understand how most people's brains actually are wired. Okay, uh, first scientist wants to give the drug to 1,000 people, see how many of them experience lower blood pressure. And the second scientist wants to give the drug to 500 people with high and to not give the drug to another 500 people with high and then see how many in each group. You already know kind of how this works because we spent the first six weeks building up to it, but which one of these is a better way of testing the drug? Well, experiments require control. And the second method is the control. It says, you know, you could give it to all of them and you could see a change, but maybe you'd see a change anyway. So splitting the, the set into two groups of 500 and administering the drug to one and perhaps a placebo or just nothing to the other is the more effective way of testing the drug. And so the answer is obviously number two. So mathematical formulation. So the GSS, which is what's referenced in our textbook, is the American Stats survey that has been run since 1972 and they run it over and over and over again asking the same questions so it's a longitudinal study it, it's evaluating the same thing over time to see how societal customs change you know you all have parents and i'm sure they talk about the good old days and grandparents are even worse but society does change and the way that we deal with things change our laws change our culture changes and this is a mechanism the u.s put in place to monitor that and to study the complexities and to try and answer questions about you know how do people feel today that they didn't feel 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago and canada has a very similar thing from StatsCan, which has started in 1985 it's just, for some reason, harder to get the data from Canada. It, it, StatsCan is very protective of their data. So it's hard to actually get the original data. So the GSS, a lot of it is public. And so the GSS actually asks that question. It's on the survey. So this is sent out to 1,000 people or 600 people, and they're asked to answer that question. And it's designed as a test of their statistical knowledge, of their understanding of how science works with controlled experiments. And in the 2010 version of the survey, 99 people answered that they should just give the drug to 1,000 people, because 1,000 is bigger than 500, or some logic. And then another 571 said the correct answer, 500 and 500. Make a control group and test it that way. 
So, we would like to estimate the underlying population proportion. So remember, that, that, those numbers there, that's a sample. That's obviously a subset. We are actually interested in not those 671 people, but all of Americans or all of Canadians. So whatever the whole population is, that's what we want to infer. So we want to estimate the proportion of those people, all Americans, who have good intuition about experimental design. And we will do so by using the data we have, the sample we have. So in this case, what are the parameter and the point estimate? Well, the parameter is always population, population parameter, PP. And so a parameter belongs to a population. So it is the proportion of all Americans. Whereas the point estimate is an estimate. Remember what estimate means? It means a guess, an educated guess. And so what are we guessing? The results from the previous slide. And so we have a parameter, which is the proportion of all Americans everywhere who have good intuition about this experimental design. And we label that as P, the population proportion. And the point estimate is the proportion of the sampled Americans who have a good intuition about the experimental design. And that one gets a hat because that's an estimate and a guess. Great. So from the first half of the course, we've talked a lot about this, but when is it valid for me to do this? When am I able to take a sampled result and infer a population result? What do we require for this to happen? Can I just do it all the time? If I asked these five women in the front row their opinion about pizza, is that the opinion of pizza of all students at Trent. What's missing with the, me asking them? Randomization. Statistics is all about randomization. So if I don't randomize my sample, it's not generalizable. Remember the end of chapter one, we had that great graph, four by, you know, two by two, four options off the corners. And to get a result which is generalizable to all Americans, it had to be a random sample. Well, thankfully, the GSS is. It's a random sample of the population across all demographics and ages. So we can answer this question uh, with a confidence interval. That's what we talked about at the last lecture of last week, not last last week, but you know, the last week of class, week six, where we can create a confidence interval, which will always be take the point estimate and add and subtract the margin of error. But the margin of error requires the standard error and a Z star, which is pretty easy, and we just look it up. So the question that we need to be able to answer this, the secondary question, is what is the standard error of the point estimate? And this is the moment, like this transition, is actually something a lot of people never actually get, never actually understand the connection. So, so far in the course, we've talked about random variables, a small amount. And random variables have a standard deviation. And then we said, well, when we have estimators, those are also random variables. So they also have a standard deviation. And that standard deviation is given a special name. It's the standard error. And so the key is that the standard error of a point estimate, p hat, exists and is measurable and is a number but it is not the standard error of the underlying data. It's, it's a particular estimate which depends on how p hat was created. And this is the known formula for it. So in the case of a single proportion, the standard error for the estimate of the sample proportion p hat is the square root of the fraction p times 1 minus p divided by n. And you'll notice there that that uses p. Except p is what we want to find. p is not what we know. p is the underlying truth. We don't actually know the answer for what p is. This is actually, though, the formula. So n is the number of samples. It's, it's a sample proportion. So you've got 671 people who are surveyed about this particular question. P is the underlying thing, but we don't know it. So you cheat and you say, well, if I randomly sampled 
and I have enough samples, p hat and p should basically be the same thing. So I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to take p hat, and I'm going to plug it into this equation, and I'm going to use it instead. And it mostly works. So the reason that this works goes back to, again, chapter 2 with the central limit theorem. And it says that if you have a sample proportion, remember we took a look at all of the graphs of all of the simulations we ran in all the big examples so far in the term, and they were all normal. They were all kind of nice, single, unimodal humps that look like a bell. So we determined that they will be nearly normally distributed with mean equal to the true population mean and standard error equal to whatever that is on the last slide. This says that p hat is actually distributed as a normal random variable that looks like that. And that opens the door to the entire mechanism we're using in this chapter because we now say if we can estimate p hat, which is really, really easy. It's how many people said the right answer to the question divided by how many people were asked. That part's trivial. It's just the sample proportion. We can then say that thing has a normal distribution with this standard error, this mean, and therefore I can do hypothesis tests on it. And that's really the key of how we transition into the full null hypothesis framework, is that everything we measure, which is sample driven, will be given a distribution which will determine which type of hypothesis test we can apply to it. And I'm hoping you'll see the connection and that they're all really the same. And actually what, what happens is that they're all basically the same framework and you, you, you replace one piece in each based on what you're actually looking at. So look for that as we go through chapter three and keep it in mind is, you know, next semester if you take 1052 as you go into the rest of the course because it's all the same thing over and over and over again, changing out one piece of the formula each time. So when is this true? What do we require for p hat to be normally distributed? It's the requirements of the central limit theorem. And we only learned about it really last week, or you know, the last week of class. So I'm not expecting you to necessarily remember it, but you will, by the end of the semester, need to know the, the conditions of the central limit theorem. They need to be independent observations, and you need to have enough samples. So not only do we have to sample randomly, but then we have to also know that the results are independent. You don't have to sample randomly to get independence, but it does kind of make it very easy. And then the enough samples rule is the rule of thumb, which says that you need at least 10 successes and 10 failures, or n times p needs to be 10. And there's a couple different ways of doing it. Largely, it's just a quick check to go, does this make sense? Like, do I have enough failures and enough successes that let the results are actually going to make any sense whatsoever? And most of the time it works. So our, our rule of thumb will be that you need <laughs> at least 10 success cases and at least 10 failure cases. And if you don't have that, you need to stop. And at that point in the problem, you say, wait a minute. I don't have 10 successes and 10 failures, which means the central limit theorem doesn't apply, which means I don't know the distribution of my sample. Now, you can still do the analysis. But at that point, all of the approximations, remember last class, the whole idea with the normal approximation is that it is a good approximation. If the central limit theorem fails, it's not a good approximation anymore. And that whole method gets thrown out the window. And all you have left is the permutation test using simulation in R, where you actually set it up and you run 10,000 iterations of the same trial over and over again. That will always work. And that's why we taught it to you first. The approximation only works under the condition that the central limit theorem applies. So linking it back, uh, when, with the case studies in chapter two, we can always use that. It will always give good results. The normal method only works if the central limit theorem applies. That's what I was just saying. So let's go back to this question, back to the GSS. So 571 of those 670 people surveyed, 85%, answered the question correctly. Estimate, using a 95% confidence interval, the proportion of all Americans that this associates with. So if 85% of this survey said yes, what do we think the true underlying proportion is with a 95% confidence interval? And so we have the formula for the confidence interval. That was in chapter two. So we just have to apply it. So we start by listing what we know. 
And this is the point too where, where I'm getting questions sometimes sent to me by email and by Slack where I get the feeling people are just trying to flail at their computers to answer the questions on web work. Like you just kind of try and answer it without doing anything. And we're hitting the point in the course where that won't work very often anymore. You actually need a piece of paper and are together. And you sit there and you work it through and then you answer the question in the little boxes. It's not designed for you to be able to just kind of click the right answer anymore. A lot of times you actually have to do some work. And so we're building up to kind of force you to practice these kind of techniques over and over again. So today's lecture should give you everything you need for the entire assignment. Some of it was doable already if you kind of had paid attention at the end of chapter two, but this will give you all the formulas and all the techniques you need to answer all those questions. This is what we know, and it's always good to write down what you know. We know how many people there were, and we know what p hat was, because we know it was 571 out of 670. What are the conditions? We need independence. We get that because it was a randomly sampled survey. Do we have 10 successes and 10 failures? Yes, because we have 571 successes as we've defined it and 99 failures again as we've defined it. Both are bigger than 10. We're good to go. Central limit theorem does apply. This p hat is distributed approximately normally. And that means we can find the standard error. So if the formula is the standard error of p hat is the square root of p 1 minus p over n, which of the following statements is the correct calculation for the 95% confidence interval. So with the 95%, you need a Z star that corresponds to 95.95. And that is the Z star that between minus Z star and Z star is 95% of the area. And that's one of the four standard numbers that come up all the time in stats. And so if you don't know which one it is, I'll just tell you it's not 1.65. And so it's 1.96. So it's one of those. So which one of those is correct? Well, looking at it, this one doesn't even have the right p hat. Because it's supposed to be, remember, the estimate plus or minus. So this one's wrong. And this one doesn't have the square root over the entire thing. And so the correct answer is the first one, which has all of the pieces of the formula together. And when you do that, one of the most common errors that we've had this week uh, on this assignment is people not being able to do square roots. I know it seems really silly, but actually calculator skills are something you get rusty on really quick, especially if you haven't done it in a while. If you didn't take your 12 calculus or anything like that, you haven't used your calculator in a while. Be careful when you're computing a square root. Do the fraction first, then take the square root of the resulting answer, if you're at all uncertain, or use lots and lots of brackets, and then you're fine. That is a Z star from R. And so what, what command would, and it's a great question. So the question is, where, where does this come from? And I just sort of told you it wasn't the 1.65. But if you needed to compute this, what would be the command that you would put into R? We're looking for a Z from an area. So which one is it? Q norm. What would you put into Q norm? We're looking for the 95% in the middle. So what number goes into Q norm? Take a minute and think about it. If you have paper in front of you, quickly sketch yourself a normal and think about it. You want 95% of the area right down the middle. Q norm goes to the left. So it includes all of that 95% plus the extra little bit down at the bottom because it doesn't know, it just goes to the left. So to get the right number, you actually need, I am not going to be able to do this. <laughs> Q norm of 0.975. Because it's the 95% that you want that is in the middle plus the 2.5% that is on the left tail. Because Q norm just says, what's my area to the left? If you did Q norm of 0.95, it's saying from here 
all the way to minus infinity is 95% of the area, which would mean there'd be 5% on the other side, which would not be 95% in the middle. It's a little tricky the first few times you do it, and you do need to kind of try and get this clear in your head, because as you're starting to see from the quizzes and the assignments, this just comes up all the time, over and over again. There's a reason that we gave you two assignments in a row just making you do this 25 times. It's actually an important skill to have to be able to do this, because we're not getting you to look stuff up in tables. So this is your mechanism for finding these numbers, is using these two functions. So this is our answer, and this says that our 95% confidence interval for the proportion of all Americans who have good intuition about experimental design is between 0.825 and 0.879. So somewhere between 82 and 88% of Americans have good intuition about experimental design. Somehow, somewhere, they learned about controls and the idea that you need a control. All right, so a new idea. Now that you have all of this, and we've kind of gone back over the formula from chapter two and showed a little bit more where it comes from, we can go in reverse. And this is a common thing in, in pretty much all math courses. Once you learn the forward mechanism, you learn the backward. We taught you P norm, and then we taught you Q norm to go backwards. And here, we've got the method for going forward from a sample and a number to find something now I want to ask the other question, which is, I'm setting up my equations. I want to run an experiment. How many people do I have to sample to make my margin of error 1%? Now, there's a lot buried in this one sentence. So you know, this is not a question you can just answer. You actually have to think about it. You actually have to do math, scary as that is. So we want to know how many people should you sample? So that is n. That's how many people you sample, little n. And we want to cut the margin of error. So the margin of error, remember, is z star times the standard error. So I need to find the n such that z star times the standard error is 1%. Now, you have to place this in the context of the last question. You have to know what 1% means. So going back one, I said this out loud. 0.825 and 0.879 is my confidence interval for my true proportion. And I just blithely said that's 82 and 88%. And you can do that too. But that translation between percent and proportion is kind of important here. So we want to cut the margin of error, which is this stuff right here. All of this down to 1%, which means 0 0.01. You see the, see the connection? See how that works? So I want the n that I would put into that equation so that I can get that thing equal to 0 0.01. And this is how you do these n questions, is that they give you this, and then you're expected to write down the piece that you want to make that size, how big you want to do it, and then you have to solve the equation, which is something that I know a lot of you, not being math people, uh, you, know, you haven't taken math in a while, it can be a little difficult. This is where you really need to go slow and careful and use your paper. You've got to work it through slow. So let's start doing it. The margin of error is z star times the standard error. So I want that margin of error to be 0 0.01 or smaller. So 0 0.01 is greater than or equal to the equation for the right-hand side, which is 1.96 and the square root of 0 0.85, 0 0.15, and n. n is not 671 here. n is unknown because we're trying to find the n that will make it true. So now that you have this, there's only one unknown left. And this is how algebra works. Now, we have one unknown, and we want to rearrange and solve this so that we figure out what n is required. So first thing I do is I square both sides. And that may not be your instinct to do it, but 
For these questions, you can literally memorize that for all of these find n questions, you always need to do this because the right-hand side always has a square root. And you don't want to try and solve that while the square root is still floating around. It just makes life really tricky. So you square both sides, which means you take every single piece in the expression and you square it. So we have 0.01 squared, 1.96 squared, and the square root squared which just gets rid of the whole square root sign, makes it a little bit simpler. Now we have something we can actually manipulate because we have an n, which is floating around in the denominator, and everything else is numbers. And at this point, you are totally fine to start absorbing constants together, start actually multiplying things together and figuring out what they are. So you can take 1.96 squared times 0.85 times 0.15, that gives you a number. Then you have a number on the left-hand side, which is 0.01 squared. Be careful. Don't drop that square because it'll just throw everything right off if you do. So you have to square that one before you go to the next step. And we can cross multiply that n. And that's the technique for solving when your thing is in the denominator. Cross multiply it to the other side. And then we divide both sides by 0.01 squared to get rid of that. And we end up with n is greater than or equal to 1.96 squared times 0.85 times 0.15 all divided by 0.01 all squared. And that number is 4,898.04. Now, I cannot sample 0.04 of a person. You know, I'm not going to walk up to you and say, I would like to sample your thumb, please, or your, your big toe. So you can't sample a partial person. So anytime you do a problem like this, you always round up. And it's not really rounding, it's ceiling. It doesn't matter what the number is. If it's not 0.00000000, it goes up. You go up to the next person to make sure. Question? Do you mind just going back to the previous slide just for a quick second? There's... So let's run through it again. This is the equation we start with, which you have to do from the word problem. Then you square both sides to get rid of the square root. You cross multiply the n. You cross divide the number that's left, and then you solve. That's the point fifteen. So the p would be Yeah. So I just I've put the numbers in there oh. already. So so going back one more slide to the original equation, just make sure you get this. So the original expression said z star times the standard error. And that standard error has a numerator, which is p hat times 1 minus p hat. And that's 0.85. And 1 minus 0.85 is 0.15. And so that's those two numbers. And then they get used all the way through. And so then in the next step, we start doing things. We bring it all together. We end up getting a number on the right-hand side. And that's 4,898.04. And you just bring it up to the next round whole number, 4,899 samples. So our margin of error, I'm just going to jump back a little bit again. When we did 671 samples, we had a margin of error that worked out to be about, call it 3%, somewhere in that ballpark, 3, 3.5%. That's 671. By going up to 4,899 samples, asking, you know, five times as many people, we can lower that margin of error down to 1%. This is used all the time in polling and survey analysis. You've all seen political polls reported in the paper, and they always report it accurate to some level. They pre-choose that level, and then they survey until they get enough people to drop it to that point. So you choose how accurate you want your survey to get because it is obviously quite a bit more expensive to send out surveys to ballpark 5,000 people instead of 670 people. The more people you survey, the more expensive the survey is, but the more accurate the results become. This is why we do censuses every five years. Because the census, while it is very expensive, is high quality, and accurate, and we can use it to actually decide things about Canada.
Where, where do the resources need to go? Where do we need new fire stations? Where do we need new paramedic stations? Where do we, are we going to need schools in six to ten years? Because schools don't get built overnight. You have to plan where those schools are going to be demographically a decade in advance. Because you've got to lay the groundwork, find the land, buy the school, figure out if it's worth renovating another school. It's actually a terrifically complicated problem. And it's really, really reliant on high quality census data to know how many people there are and how many babies those people are having. So, um, tricky bit that kind of again we glossed over. We don't know P, so again we use P hat. If you are doing a study, and you kind of think about this logically, if you are doing a study and you want to know how many people to sample, and you don't have any data yet, you don't have that 0.85. That came from the data. So what do we do? Well, you don't know it. And so you do the worst case scenario. Either you can run a pilot study, which is kind of like this, where you run a few hundred people, you get a ballpark idea of what the number is going to be, and then you use that to find your N to do the work. Or you do the worst case scenario. You say, I don't know what it is. What will I do instead? Just plug in 0.5. And for anybody who's actually curious why you use 0.5, uh, the function there is p times 1 minus p. If you expand that out, that's p minus p squared. That's a quadratic, a concave down quadratic. It has a local maximum at 0.5. So the highest number you can make n b using this technique is by using 0.5. So you basically do worst case, and you say, well, it could be 0.5. So let's get enough people that even if it is 0.5, my margin of error still gets driven down to the point I want for the study I'm designing, and so on. And so if you're not given any data and you're asked to design an N, you default to 0.5. So this is the explanation. It is the most conservative estimate. It gives the largest possible sample size. Okay, so stop for a minute and try and frame this in what we know so far. So with confidence intervals, we need at least 10 observed successes and 10 observed failures. That, that was our rule that we did at the end of chapter two. You need that many observed in each case for it to be a valid approximation and be able to find the confidence interval and write it down. In hypothesis testing, you don't need quite the same thing. It's still the 10 and 10, but you need 10 expected of each of these cases, 10 expected successes and 10 expected failures. And the difference is, in a confidence interval, you start from the data, and it matters about how many samples you have in the data, whereas in the hypothesis test, it's about your null hypothesis. That's about what you expect to have given the null. And so you have to set it up very slightly differently, and it's a little bit tricky to kind of get it clear in your head. So in the case of a confidence interval, our standard error is computed using the formula we've been using all along, square root of p1 minus p over n. And we use our p hat as our substitute there because we don't actually know. In the case of a hypothesis test, your null will be stated. Either you stated it or it's been given to you. And so when you're computing a standard error under a null hypothesis framework, you use the provided null hypothesis. You use P0 in your formulas. And typically P0 is 0.5 in a proportion test because your default is it's a 50-50 chance. You know, coin flip, that's all that's going on, there's nothing special. Versus some alternative which is very specific and says, oh no, it's actually much bigger than 50%. Than so we now have some formulas, and you should probably start keeping track of them and trying to clarify them. Make a little formula sheet for yourself. We will have a one sheet formula sheet on the final exam for you, and we'll post that well before the actual exam, so you have the chance to go over it and figure out how it works. So you're not expected to memorize these, but you are expected to know when and how to use them, and that part we will not be helping you with. Yes. That, that's part of what, so the question is lab practice exam to kind of get a feel for what the lab exam is going to be like. That's part of why we still haven't scheduled is We're trying to figure out whether we want to do one in the 
workshop, or if we want to just give you, here's three examples of what your lab exam could be. Do it on your own time in the next three weeks, and by the way, it's due on this date because that's the day you have to do one for real. So we're, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do there, and, and Dr. Dr. Boy needs to chime in and give her opinion as well before we finalize that. We'll do that quite soon, though. So you will definitely have seen something like the lab exam before you do the lab exam, whether it's the previous workshop to show you how it works or if it's actually just a take home like, here they are, this is what you should do, and then we'll post some solutions and you have the chance to try. It's what the null actually is stated as, yeah. So your null hypothesis in a single proportion case is P naught equals number. So that, that, like, that's how you state it. So you have that number and then you just sub it in. So good question. Any other questions so far? OK. So back to the GSS, back to this question. We've done all class. 571 answered the question correctly. Does this data set, do these data provide convincing evidence that more than 80% of Americans have good intuition about experimental design? So we write down from that word problem our hypotheses. And our null hypothesis in this case is P0 equals 0.8. Because we're asking about whether it's bigger than that. And so your null is that it is, it's not bigger than that, it is that. And then your alternative is that it is truly greater than 0.8. And you have to be very careful. Get, get practice at this. Reading these things and determining whether it is a one or a two-tailed test is a very important skill. And we are trying to give you practice problems that emphasize that skill. This current assignment has several where you, know, you have to set up the right alternative or the whole question is not going to make any sense. And you'll get the wrong numbers, and it'll tell you they're wrong, and then you have to think about it. So don't assume you do the, the math wrong. It could just be your whole setup's wrong. Stop and think about the actual framework of the problem and what the alternatives actually can be. So this is one tail because the question says more than. It's very clear that it's bigger than 80 is what we're interested in. And so that's our alternative hypothesis. And so now the question is, how do we actually finish this? How do we do a hypothesis test? So there's actually two ways. We've already done one way. We computed the confidence interval. Remember what the rule is for confidence intervals? How do we translate a confidence interval result into a hypothesis conclusion? If the confidence interval overlaps the null, what do you do? Remember this number line? I'm going to try and draw it with my mouse. We'll see if this works. So if we have a number line, and we have a null hypothesis. Yeah, I can't do. I can do lines. I can't do words. So if I have p naught, is there? If I have a confidence interval that looks like that, what would the conclusion of my hypothesis be? In that case, I would fail to reject the null because my confidence interval, my 95% confidence about where it is, overlaps the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is plausible. So I fail to reject it. If my confidence interval is sitting out to the right or out to the left, so if my confidence interval was up here, I would reject because it doesn't overlap the null. So the null is not a plausible result. So I reject it. Question? Is that specifically That's for any confidence interval. Yeah, so, so the thing about hypothesis tests is that we always do it under some level of alpha, some 0 0.05, 0 0.1, something, just like we do for the confidence. And so it translates perfectly. They're actually very equivalent. So if you have the confidence interval already, you know the answer before you start. So we have the confidence interval for the proportion of all Americans. And it started at 0.828 or something like that, 0.83, which definitely is bigger than 0.8. So we already know that we are going to reject the null because our confidence interval is larger than our null hypothesis and therefore it is not a plausible result. But we can do it the other way as well. So we have our P, this is our P naught, and so we use our P naught in the computation of our standard error. So 0.8 and 0.2 this time instead of 0.85. 
because that's our null, not our sample result, which gave us 0 0.0154. And then we compute the z, and about half of the assignment is this equation over and over again. And your accurate computation of the standard error is what determines whether you get the question right or wrong. So you have to think about that. And z is our p hat minus our p naught divided by the number that is our standard error. And our z, in this case, works out to be 3.25. Again, just be careful with your calculator work. You know, don't, don't get the question wrong because you didn't divide right. Do the top, then divide the bottom. Question? No. Once we have this, how do we finish a hypothesis test normally? Other way around. If the null is inside the confidence interval, then it's in the area that is plausible, which means it's a totally valid answer to get, which means you don't reject it. If it's not in the confidence interval, then the confidence interval is over here saying, we're plausible, we're aware the action's happening, and the null's over there. You're like, well, you're just wrong, so you reject it. So that's how you interpret the confidence intervals in terms of the hypothesis language. For regular hypothesis tests, what do we do next? What's the last step in a hypothesis test for the math? I've computed my test statistic, my z. What's the last step? What's the last step of everything we've done all semester? The p-value. We did it in every simulation and every approximation so far. You end a hypothesis test with a computation of a p-value, which makes your decision for you. So we need a p-value for this z. So I take 1 minus the p-norm of 3.25. Why is it 1 minus the p-norm? Pardon me? Yes, we have an upper-tailed test. It's greater than, so we want the area toward that tail, which is from 3.25 to the right. And what does p-norm do? It goes to the left. And so p-norm goes down, and it gives you the area that's to the left, which is nice, but sort of irrelevant. What I want is it's reciprocal. I want the rest of it, the stuff that is to the right. So I take 1 minus, and an R. It tells me 0 0.000577 or 0.0006. Since the p-value is lower than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. The data do provide convincing evidence that more than 80% of Americans have a good intuition about experimental design. As a logical check for yourself on something like the final, where we're asking you to do these things, you can do it both ways. If they don't agree, you did something wrong. The confidence interval method and the compute the test statistic p-value method must agree. And if they don't agree on the conclusion, one of them is wrong. So it's a good way to kind of, if you, if you get fast at it, it's a good way to quickly check your work and go, I don't know about this result. Let me just quickly do it the other way. Even if you're not asked to, you won't lose marks for it. And it's a way of checking your work. Here's another one, so uh, kind of topical. I didn't actually intend this. When I wrote these slides, I hadn't really figured out that what today was. So 11% of 1,001 Americans responding to a Gallup survey stated that they have objections to celebrating Halloween on religious grounds. They don't want to celebrate Halloween. They think it's bad, OK? So at a 95% confidence level, the margin of error was plus or minus 3%. Fine, that's the setting. Then a news piece on this study states more than 10% of all Americans have objections on religious grounds to celebrating Halloween. Is this a valid statement? What do you think? Now, tear it apart. Some Americans have objections, right? That's fine. Our question here is precision. It's science. Is it correct to say more than 10%? That's the question. 
That's really what we're asking here, is more than 10%. Is that part correct? Because clearly, some people have objections. That's fine. I'm not arguing that, because 11% said yes. But is it more than 10%? So think about it. Take a stand. Which side do you agree with? Is it yes, no, or can't tell? The answer is no. It is not justified. And here's the reason. The 95% confidence interval for the true underlying proportion of all Americans who think Halloween is evil and will not, will not celebrate it because they hate chocolate and fun are 11 minus 3 up to 11 plus 3. The estimate minus the margin of error and the estimate plus the margin of error, which is 8 and 14. Does that confidence interval overlap their null of 10? Yes. It also overlaps 9 and 8. So if your alternative is more than 10%, we would not go with that alternative. We would go with the null hypothesis because we don't know that it's more than 10. It could be 8, it could be 9, it could be 10, it could be 11, 12, so on, but we just don't know. So you have to be very careful with your language, actually, and the news is really bad at interpreting stats in this way because they say more than 10 because 11 is more than 10. And you're like, well, that's nice, but actually the confidence interval runs from 8 to 14, so you could say more than 8. And then I'd buy it, but not more than 10. And 10 is a nice round number. That's why they went with it, but it's actually wrong. We had a question uh, similar to this kind of interpretation like this on an assignment a couple weeks ago. It was the same thing, and people were struggling with it because they didn't quite get their head around the fact that actually saying that it's more than a certain thing means your confidence interval is bigger than that thing. Not your estimate, but your whole confidence interval. OK, recap on what we've done so far. So we have inference for one proportion. The population parameter is p, and the point estimate is p hat. And the conditions for this to work. We require independence of the samples. So we have to randomly sample. That, that gives us our independence most of the time. We need it to be less than 10% of the population. This does not come up very often, but when it does, you need to keep an eye out for it. You'd have to have a condition where it's clear that the population is small enough to even consider this. So for example, if you were doing a survey like the GSS on Trent students, then you start to be borderline. Because there's only about 7,000. And so as soon as you hit 700, 705 students, you start to exceed 10%. And your statistics actually change. There's some subtleties there. It doesn't happen very often because normally it's so expensive to run surveys, people wouldn't even dream of doing 10%. But it can happen, so keep an eye out for it. And all that happens there is it says you fail the conditions, and you just stop because you don't know what to do next. We need at least 10 successes and 10 failures. If any of these fail, what it does is it kills your normal approximation. But it doesn't prevent you from solving the problem. You can still do the permutation test, just like we did in the last two chapters, and you can still get a p-value, and you can still compute the answer. You just can't use the normal approximation to jump that step. And the standard error is the square root of p, 1 minus p over n. If you're doing a confidence interval, you use the p hat as your p. If you're doing the hypothesis test, you use the null for your p. So same formula, different p's. And this is the normal point in a course, and there's a couple people in here who actually have taken another version of this class, or have taken a stats class before, but it didn't count when they transferred to Trent. And you'll have seen this, where this opens the door and starts the section of the course that is just the confusion weeks, where you just go, variations of this formula, and you're supposed to memorize all the different variations and somehow regurgitate them on the exam. We have stripped this course down to the bare bones in terms of how many formulas we're actually going to throw at you, but this is the first point where you actually see it. Those two things use exactly the same formula, but with a different number substituted in. And you are expected to understand the distinction and be able to use the right number. So keep an eye on that and just make sure you know what's happening. So let's do one final big example, kind of tie this all together. Today's uh, lecture is a little bit shorter because the other section was about 
45 minutes behind us. So I don't want to get too far ahead of them. So we're just kind of going to where they ended on Friday, and that's about it. They needed to use the first half of their lecture to get caught up. So question is this, libraries. Has anybody been following the news about the UK? Yeah? UK's government is currently slashing and burning social programs and are closing libraries or like taking libraries and just handing them over to volunteer organizations with no funding and saying good luck and then walking away. UK is actually very, very close to losing its public library system, which is incredibly sad because the UK was one of the first places in the world that had a public library system. And yeah, it's just that's what happens when you let people be in charge of a country who believe that money is the be all and end all of things instead of social services and actually supporting your people. So here's an example like that, but in a place where they're actually doing a survey, so clearly they care about what people think. Do the majority of voters in a large city favor increasing the funding for the local library system? So they do a poll of 250 randomly selected voters and found 140 of those people supported increasing the funding, knowing that it comes in the end of the day out of their property taxes, and that's, that's how you pay for things, is with property taxes. So 140 out of 250. So we set up a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. When we say the majority, what does that mean? Yes, more than 50%. And as the Quebec referendum, in my lifetime, and kind of like you were very, very young at that point. I, I remember the news ads from it. I'm that, that old. 50.1 um, is still a majority and will still win you the, the vote. Literally, that's how close it came to Quebec voting to leave Canada. 50.1%. And there were shenanigans all over the place going on. So it's still debatable to this day whether it was actually 50.1%. But it's kind of died down now and, and most people don't care. So all we need is slightly more than half to be able to say it is a majority. So what are the assumptions? We have a random sample. So we have independence from that. We have a large sample size. We assume it's a large city, and therefore 250 people is a drop in the hat. We're not talking about a hamlet of 400 people. This is 250 people out of a million or something like that. We have NP0 and N1 minus P0 being 125. So under the hypothesis test with P0 being a half, we have more than 10 expected successes and more than 10 expected failures. So we're good for hypothesis testing. And that means all the conditions are met and we are good to proceed with our hypothesis test under normal approximation levels. So we start with our P hat, compute it. Be very careful with this step. If you screw this up, it th throws the whole rest of the problem off. So p hat, it's just a fraction, but you'd be amazed how many mistakes you can make with a calculator. So 140 over 250 is 0.56. Compute the standard error. We are doing a hypothesis test. The standard error uses the null as its p. You do not use 0.56 here. You use 0.5. And so we use 0.5 and 0.5, because that's what 1 minus 0.5 is, giving us a standard error of 0.031623. One other mistake that people are making quite commonly is they're truncating these things. Honestly, when it comes to an assignment problem, keep six or seven decimals. It doesn't hurt anybody because you're copy pasting it out of R anyway. And, and just sort of, if you haven't clued into this, when we say to report something to a certain accuracy in web work, you can put as many decimals as you want. It's not going to be mad at you. What we're saying by that is we're checking your answer rounded to the nearest whatever we've said. So literally, if you do it in R and it gives you an eight decimal number, double click, paste. Put that eight decimals in and move on. That's totally fine. It doesn't care. And it will just take your answer, round it, and then compare it. And then you've got all of the precision. In particular, now that we're getting multi-stage computations here, where you have compute the p hat, compute the standard error, then put it all together, You've got to keep your decimals. You've got to keep your precision, or your final answer is going to be rounded a little bit too aggressively, and it's going to be off by just enough that the computer is going to tell you you're wrong. And that's happened to almost everybody, right? So just start keeping more decimals. Combine these to make a test statistic. So we have our formula for Z test. We take our P hat, we subtract our P naught, and we divide by our standard error. And then the result is 1.8974. 
Now, this is a one-tailed hypothesis test. So let's put it all together and answer the question. This is the visualization of the p-value. So this is a normal curve. That's our 1.89 that we just computed. That's the area to the right. You're going to learn how to make this plot in the workshop this week. Some people have been asking. They want to be able to make a plot that actually has a shaded area. So that's one of the things we're going to do this week. I don't know why they want to know. But people want to know, and it's kind of a neat thing to learn. So we have a shaded area now. And that number's going to be small-ish. It's always good to check this and kind of just have an idea like, is that going to be like 0.5? No, it'll be small, like 0.05, 0.01, somewhere down in there, right? 1 minus the p-norm, because it's area to the right, not the area to the left. And the resulting answer is 0 0.029, or 0 0.02888758. Do we reject the null under this condition? 95% alpha 0.05 standard hypothesis test. Do we reject the null hypothesis? Yeah, absolutely. This is smaller than 0.05. That's how your p-value works. It's small, alpha is bigger, you reject the null, you go with the alternative. We do have evidence of a majority supporting the increased funding. Was there a question over here? I saw a hand. Because, so the question is, why did I use 0.5 in my computation of my standard error? So go back a couple of slides. Why did I use 0.5? Right here. There are two versions of the formula. One for confidence intervals, which uses p hat, and one for hypothesis tests, which uses p naught. This is a hypothesis test. We have to use p naught. p naught is 0.5. Getting those two clear in your head is most of what this section is about. That and relearning how to do basic math. Absolutely. You are allowed to use any resource that is yours on the quizzes. Piece of paper and pen, a calculator if you want one, R, and any R code you've written yourself. That's, that's the only restriction, and I mean, it's hard for us to police, but like no alt tabbing and loading up a web browser and pulling up slides, right? But if it's in R and you've typed it yourself, it's fair game. You can use it. Go ahead. And so if you want to start keeping a R sheet, which is just like, this is how I do these things and have it open during the quizzes, you are allowed to do that so long as you prepare it yourself. But it has to be in R. It has to be R stuff. It's mostly like, we don't expect you to fully memorize all the R syntax. But we don't want you to know how to use it. And so if you can look it up, if you know how to look it up, that's great. But it has to be within R. Yes? Sorry. Shh. Use an R script for what? Sorry? Yes. As I've been encouraging people, anybody, anytime I talk to them, and I did post an announcement saying this, as you're working through your R stuff in the workshops, obviously you, you prepare like a script every time you go to workshop, right? You should amalgamate all of that into one clean R markdown document or R script. And you can have that open during your lab exam. So it can show you how to do all the things. In fact, what I'm anticipating is if I give you one ahead of time for you to practice, you're going to figure out how to do it, and you're going to prepare it. And so long as you know what you're doing, in 90 minutes, you can take the new data and the new setup and translate the old code. And that's what I expect you to do. I do not expect you to write 100 lines of our code on your own in 90 minutes. Your first years. That's, that's excessive. I do expect you to be able to repeat what you've already done by using your old code, by using your old examples, by using anything you have open in R and translating it. I'm not trying to make this lab exam something that's going to fail you. I just want you to demonstrate that you have learned how to do something like that. Which, you know, if you're doing a homework problem, you're not going to like try and do it all on your own in front of your computer. You're going to look stuff up. And that's fine. It's just in a lab exam, the lookups have to be restricted to just your own work. That's all. Good question, though. Like, like, and if you have questions about it or clarification, come talk to me. Send me an email. Send me a Slack message. I'm happy to talk about what I expect. There is our p-value, p-value. So we already kind of know that we are rejecting the null. We've done it one way. Let's do it the second way. The formula is p-hat 
plus or minus z star times the standard error. But as per his question, when you're doing a confidence interval, the standard error is not the same number. You have to stop. And you have to recompute the standard error using p hat. Confidence interval p hat, hypothesis test p naught. Different numbers, same formula. Getting that clear in your head is really the point of today's lecture. Put that together, and we end up with a slightly different number. And for a 95% confidence interval, we are going to use this. Now, why did I use Q norm of 0.95 this time? Remember the question I asked earlier? We did Q norm of 0.975. Why am I using Q norm of 0.95? This is a one-tailed test, not a two-tailed test. And in this case, I actually want the 95 Question, sorry? Could you kind of explain in more how it justifies You're looking for keywords like greater than, less than, bigger than, smaller than. If you don't see them, you go two-tail. The default is always two-tail. You need something to promote the alternative to you, which is to say it's a one-tail. In this case, because we were asking, we weren't asking whether the number who supported the library was not 0.5. We were saying we want the majority. We actually care about whether or not it's a yes. Because, I mean, if the majority is saying no, that's the opposite of what we care about, right? So you're looking for a keyword in the problem that leads you to believe that the interest is only in one side of the equation and the rest is all just null. So, you know, if, if, if the number is 0.4, that's equivalent to 0.49, it was just equivalent to 0.5. It's all just less than a majority and so we don't go for it. That's all one category. But greater than 0.5, that's saying majority. So you're looking for some keyword that triggers that. And in the assignment questions, we're trying to make sure we mix them up. And sometimes it's two, and sometimes it's one, and so on. So, and if you get stuck on those, that again, hop on Slack and just ask. And just say, you know, I read this, and I saw this wording, and I thought that was a one tail. What did, like, am I right? And, and we're happy to talk about that. Intelligent questions are always a pleasure to answer. Like where you've done the work, you've thought about it, and you go, you know what? This is where I'm stuck. I could get this question if it wasn't just for this fact that I'm stuck right here. You know, so, so try and make your questions focused and say, I've got most of it, but, and that, that's great. The ones where I'm stuck help. It's hard because I don't know where to start. I'm like, well, did you get started? Like, did, are you partway through? Or, or are you just like literally you stared at the first word and the through you and you just don't know how to proceed? Because, you know, sometimes that's what I get. So um, why do I do 0.95 here? It is a one tailed test. And if you go back, and I do suggest you go back, in week, I think, four or five, when we first developed confidence intervals, we talked a little bit about how do you do Z stars for confidence intervals that are one-tailed. And you always kind of go with a larger number for your Z star in that situation. So here we end up going with Q norm of 0.95 because we want the area to be left to be 0.95 and the area to the right to be 0.05 because we want a 95% confidence interval, but it's a one-tailed 95%. And so that's why 95% is there instead of 97.5. Put that all together. It's the, uh, one of the three numbers. This number, 1.645, 1.96, and 2.35, or 36, are the three numbers that show up all the time in stats. They are the 90, 95, and 99 two-tailed numbers. Or correspondingly, they are the 95, uh, 99, and 99.9 .9 one-tailed numbers. And that gives us a confidence interval of 0 0.508 and 0 0.620. What's the interpretation of this? Put it back in words. We are 95% confident that the true proportion of city residents who support increasing funding for the library system is between 50.8% and 62%. Does that confidence interval overlap the null? Is 50% inside that interval? No. Therefore, reject. Therefore, the same answer as the previous iteration, which is good. If they disagree, we screwed up. We reject the null. The same conclusion. There is evidence to support a majority of city residents favoring increasing the funding to the library system. 
There is an alternative in R. I personally don't like it because it's more complicated, and more complicated means more likely to cause you to make mistakes. But rather than do this entire thing, if all you want is the answer, the yes, no answer, or the confidence interval answer, there is a function called prop test, which stands for proportion test in R. And you have to specify all this stuff to make it work. So you'd say, how many yeses were there in your original survey? How many people in your original survey? That's x and n. What's your alternative? Is it greater than, less than, or two-tailed? And actually, you have to use the words there. What confidence interval do you want? Like 95%, 99%, whatever. And you always just say correct equals false, because we don't know what that is. It's actually a correction for continuity, which we're not going to talk about. So just always say false. And if you do that, you get a p-value of 0 0.02889. That's what we got. And you get a confidence zero of 50.8 and 1, because it actually does things a little bit differently. This is the downside to kind of how this one's set up, is it gives you the confidence interval, but it's not the numbers that we will expect, but it is the right interpretation. So the only time that I encourage you to use this is if you just need the p-value, and you want to just skip right to the p-value, or if you just need the conclusion from the question. Because you can see from the confidence interval what's happening. In either of those cases, you can jump right to the end and prop test will just be like, here's your p-value, you can make your decision right now, done. And that's OK. But if you need your z, which most of the questions I've asked you on the assignment, you do, this doesn't give it to you. So you need to do that anyway, so you might as well just do it all properly and do it the long way. And you'll learn more by working through the problems a few times. OK, so we are uh, perfectly caught up to where the other class is. And I will post a full update of your grades Wednesday afternoon. I want to let the last quiz go before I post it. Have a good day.